get interpretable latent representations by composing nonlinear invertible functions and maximizing the exact locked likelihood. Flow-based models are the odd machines in the corner of the neural network laboratory capable of calculating the exact lock likelihood for every sample. Discover their arcane qualities on representative example of OpenAI's glow and its ability to unveil secrets of visual illusions. So flow-based models, how they compare to variational autoencoders and generative adversarial networks. Yeah, so flow-based models have following advantages. They perform exact latent variable inference and log likelihood. Um, and can calculate exact log likelihood compared to only an approximate uh, variation autoencoder, which perform compression and uh, completely absent uh, generative adversarial network representations, which only perform discrimination. Uh, there's a caveat here is that uh, we could potentially run into numerical problems with uh, flow-based models, but uh, and there's an article you can read a little bit more about it. I'm not familiar with this issue, but uh, okay, let's continue. Is uh, they are easy to parallelize um, in terms of uh, synthesis and uh, inference. Um, with the exception of um, autoregressive flow models and perhaps some other. Uh, they also have useful latent uh, space, uh, similar to variational autoencoder, but the latent space is necessarily richer as they don't perform compression as variational autoencoders. Uh, at the same time, it, potentially there could be some noise created there, you know, the invertibility could have some potential issues. Uh, so, fourth advantage here is that uh, with respect to depth, uh, with respect of number of layers, the memory requirements for gradient calculations are uh, constant thanks to uh, the invertibility of the network of the function inside. So the globe model architecture, uh, which is an example of flow-based model, is uh, following. So there is this diagram on this blog post I've written about this, um, which is part of this video. So uh, here we go. Uh, as an input, uh, there's an image. And uh, as an output, uh, we have a latent vector of the same dimension as the image. And uh, each dimension of this latent vector, uh, in terms of the whole data set, um, is optimized to be distributed with Gaussian uh, distribution uh, with unit variance. So how do we get to this certain representation. What is this function here in the middle that we optimize with uh, maximizing exact log likelihood? So first, because we want invertibility, we need to do a couple of tricks. So, so we take the original image and we perform this skip one pixel uh, subsampling to create four parallel images. These parallel images are treated then as a channels. So we have two dimensions in a spatial domain and uh, four channels for, as a, another dimension. On, on this, we can then perform uh, several invertible uh, blocks, uh, which form the function itself. So what we are always looking for is uh, optimizing a nonlinear functions on the inputs repeatedly. Um, and uh, then by optimizing them, we can find you know, the functions that we are looking for. Here, the nonlinear function needs to be invertible. And uh, the proposed one, the very often used one, it's called Vash affine coupling. The affine coupling uh, applies identity function on parts of the variables, so they are not changed at all by applying this function. But then on the second set of the dimensions, um, 
the variables have uh, are rescaled. I will go back to this later, but they to them we also add a output of a nonlinear function, which in this case is a convolutional uh, network with sufficient number of features, uh, which is a function of only the first set of previously identity, identity mapped uh, variables. Thanks to this, uh, it is easy to see that we can invert this because once we have the uh, only the epsilon vector, we can always get immediately, thanks to the identity mapping, the first set of original variables. And then the second set is calculated easily by just removing the uh, output of application of this nonlinear function on the first set of variables. So that's the important part. We always need to have ability to invert. That's the whole idea of this, these models is that we can go, um, we can always go from the input to the output and we can also as well map from the output to input easily. And in this case, even with the same speed computational complexity. So since we've applied uh, non-linearity only on the part of the variables, we, we have an issue that the second, the first set of variables uh, is mapped only identically, but we, you know, we are looking for useful transformation. So we need this non-linearity on all the variables. So we perform uh, generalized permutation um, which is in this case, in case of the GLOW model, just an uh, invertible linear transformation. And this transformation is applied only on the, in the channel domain, so we, it can be called one uh, times one convolution, and that's where the um, subtitle of the GLOW paper comes from. Once we've applied these two steps, these two functions, we can repeat that multiple times and on the output we get the Latin distribution. What we actually optimize for? The, so the goal of our optimization is to find a function that uh, on the output has multivariate normal distribution uh, with isotropic you know, unit variance on the Latin space and this function needs to have maximum likelihood we can achieve on the uh, data set that we have. Uh, to do this, thanks to invertibility of function f, uh, we can apply a formula for change of variables. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with it. You just take the probability, you change the uh, variables uh, in the inside of the probability and you say this is the probability on the per, on the latent space and then you have to also multiply it by absolute value of the determinant of the Jacobian. So the probability on the latent space that's what we've defined that's uh, this um, Gaussian distribution isotropic and you know that's basically a requirement for latent distribution is that the, the isotropy the, the requirement there and then this determinant uh, of the Jacobian is also easily calculated thanks to the, uh, the functions that we use, these affine couplings. Uh, they actually, uh, their determinant is very simple because they are upper, because their Jacobian is upper triangular matrix. So we apply these uh, functions as I mentioned before. Um, by composing them, uh, basically stacking up, uh, stacking up layers. So, so I will come back to this uh, invertible building block now. So this invertible function f is composed of k-trainable nonlinear invertible functions. Uh, we have uh, uh, how this nonlinearity that I mentioned looks like is that we split the dimensions into two sets. One of the one set of variables is mapped unchanged, and the second set of variables 
uh, is multiplied uh, by this nonlinear scaling functions dependent on the first set of variables plus uh, nonlinear functions applied on um, first set of variables. Uh, as I mentioned, the determinant of the Jacobian is upper triangular matrix and is easy to calculate. Thus, uh, it is just an exponential of the sum of the <coughs> of, of these scaling uh, nonlinearities. And as well, as I mentioned previously, we have to also apply this channel-wise mixing, um, invertible sort of mixing to have the nonlinear to apply to all the variables, uh, at least after several layers. The functions S and T, those nonlinearities, are convolutional neural networks with sufficient number of features such that input and output channel count is the same and we can preserve the dimensionality and make sure that we uh, that we can do, do this inversion you know that's required here in the affine coupling layer that we can see that this t and s uh, needs to have same dimension as y the splitting into uh, you know first step to have sufficient number of channels to actually then apply only those blocks first step is to split the image into four parallel images which then form the channels and that's done by this uh, skip one pixel sampling so you know first image is uh, created as following so we take uh, we sample this pixel skip this one sample this pixel then you know we go one step down, we skip this one, we go another step down and sample this one. So this is one of the images, you know, here, one five and so on. And then you know we move the first pixel on the different location and sample from there, we get four images. What is the application of this? So thanks to the ability to calculate exact likelihood, we can calculate like uh, you know probability of images appearing based on the data set we trained on and there is this paper um, which have a statistical story to tell about visual uh, illusions they use the glow model there and they focus on misjudgment of color brightness of image centers in which background was darkened or lightened we can see on this image that uh, you know the sections in the middle look that like they have different colors but actually they're the colors of the middle sections middle the center patches are the same and only the background was changed so what seems to be happening here is that the brain seems to err on side of the contrast tricking us uh, into seeing uh, the patches is differentiated more from the background than they actual are. They seem to, the brain seems to highlight the unlikely parts of the image, sort of contrasting more. Uh, I recommend you to cut up this image and verify that the middle patches are the same. It's, this illusion is very uh, hard to believe that it's not there. Um, okay, so they're, they are trying to prove by this paper about visual illusions that, in, that instead of uh, human perceiving the actual color, that the human actually perceive probability of, uh, the, of the saturation of the color being the one that it is or being lower. So as if human did this integration of likelihood of the saturation up to the saturation that it actually has. And to verify this claim, I did one more change to the simplified illusions, illusion below that uh, by I increased the saturation on one of the illusions uh, to match uh, this percentile rank, this likelihood of having saturation below and the one that there actually is um, in the context of the background and I increased it such that these uh, probabilities uh, match and after doing this uh, the vision is no longer there and I perceive the 
middle patches as being the same, which would support the hypothesis they make in the example. Okay, so that's, that's all. Uh, I hope you got the sense of what flow-based models are, in particular what the GLOW model is and how it can be used, for example, in this special case of visual illusions. Of course, you can do tricks with faces, you can generate uh, faces, interpolate, uh, you know, going from one face to another uh, smoothly. Uh, you can change people smiling and so on, but it's very common. Uh, so this is much more interesting, these visual illusions. And if you want to make sure that you remember uh, what was said in the article, uh, you can use this quiz, uh, which was automatically generated. Uh, you can read the Reddit discussion, and of course you can read the blog itself uh, on my web, web page here. Um, Okay, thank you very much, see you next time, and uh, dislike and unsubscribe, and...